um, yeah, I think we're good to go. Yes, so welcome to our call, Design Leadership Q&A with Richard Dalton joining us from Verizon, but also from a basement in New Jersey. That's right. <laughs> All right, let's just get started and let me hand it over to you, Richard. Good to have you with us. That's great. Thank you very much, Yanis. Uh, yeah, this is my basement. We haven't, we're not we we're experimenting with going back into the uh, offices these days, but uh, only one or two days a week. Um, I lead design for Verizon, uh, you know, one of the US's uh, largest telecommunications companies. And uh, I've been here about two and a half years prior to that. I was at uh, spent almost all of my career in finance, so uh, lead design, led design at Capital One, um, led design at USAA, uh, and also Vanguard, a big mutual uh, mutual fund investment company from the UK originally, uh, moved to the states in '99, and as uh, Yana said, now back on the east coast of the of the states for the last six years in my basement in uh, in New Jersey. Um, Verizon's an interesting company were like the fortune 20 actually we were the fortune 20 but i'm not sure i haven't rechecked what what number we are these days because they just published their new lists a couple of days ago um but thereabouts 130 billion dollars of revenue um about 100 billion of that comes from the consumer side 30 billion comes from the b2b side um, my design team sits within the cmo uh our marketing organization but supports all teams across verizon so i have teams lined up against the consumer space teams lined up against the b2b space um, about 600 design resources, all told. Uh, I say resources because that's a blend of full-time contract and agency labor. Uh, about 250 full-time employees, uh, another couple of hundred uh, contractors, uh, and then the, the, the rest made up by agency engagements and embedded re agency resources, both in the Northeast here in New Jersey, New York, um, and in India, uh, where we have three sites, mainly Chennai, but also uh, Hyderabad and Bangalore or Bengaluru, as it's now called. Um, uh, we support um, both what we would call channels um, within digital channels within the Verizon ecosystem. So the apps and websites that both sides of the business use to sell and promote and, and service the services. But we also support products as well. When I products so the things that people actually use so um, whether that's hardware in which we also do hardware design for routers set top boxes remote controls smart displays watches speaker bars things like that um, or whether it's the digital products that we that we sell whether that's the plans themselves the connectivity plans or whether that's um, associated apps for you know call filtering or uh, managing your Verizon Visa card or uh, stuff like that. Um, so you know we, we 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 kind of intersect the product design space and the the kind of uh, digital channel uh, space. Also have a small team focused on um, the retail space because we do have about six thousand stores across the U.S. Um, uh, both uh, resellers and uh, companies stores that we provide some of the journey design for. Uh, we don't do the um, actual architecture and interior design of the stores. What's one of our partner teams within the CMO organization. And just, uh, you know, the fact that we're in the CMO organization is quite interesting for me because it's the first time I've led a design team that is within the CMO. All the other ones were either in the kind of COO office at Capital One or in a separate digital team, at USAA and Vanguard. And so being in the CMO really brings a different perspective. Uh, it kind of helps us kind of join the brain and right brain together from a, a brand and a marketing uh, and advertising and media perspective, along with the kind of now the, the functional, you know, how to give people things that are usable and, and help them do stuff um, perspective. And so that's been an interesting journey in the last, uh, you know, couple of years as we've, you know, really worked to fuse those things together. The design team at Verizon is, uh, you know, we've had design within Verizon for, for decades, but it was very distributed. So prior to me joining by about a, a year, uh, so about three and a half years ago, we centralized the design team. My predecessor started that process. Um, and uh, so now we have about 90%, I would say, of all the designers centralized in my team. There's still a couple of pockets out there in different businesses because we've, uh, you know, acquired um, products or businesses and we've left them embedded um, 
I'm not I'm not a huge like empire builder uh, type person, right? It, 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 you know, I, I would only want people to be in the centralized team if it actually benefits the people or the work that we're doing rather than just to increase the size of the team. Um, so while I have, you know, ongoing conversations with people in different parts of the business, um, I, I'm not trying to land grab uh, resources or anything. Um, so that's the that's the the work we do and a little bit of my my history. Um, one of the things that that uh, I, I heard that I may want to share a little bit into, and I'd love to get a couple of questions to kind of help me guide me on on this conversation, is the not just the work we do, but the way we do the work. Um, so the way that we set up our design team and how we um, help uh, evolve and improve our design team. Um, from a process uh, and a people perspective, um, particularly in terms of you know operations, you know, design ops. Um, so if that's something that is interesting, maybe there's a couple of specific points that people want to hear me share about, and then I can I can get into some of that and maybe share a, a slide here. All right, that's a very good intro. Uh, I would uh, suggest let's perhaps uh, if anybody has questions, like Richard said, just jump in or write in the chat. But perhaps, Richard, we could just uh, segue into the how you work and the, the slide that you gave me a preview of, and then we can take the Q&A from there. Yeah, yeah, sure. So, um, you know, Verizon is on its own uh, agile transformation, right? Yes, yeah, our many large organizations. In fact, I think this is probably our seventh or eighth agile transformation. Um, you know, but you know, this time we really mean it, uh, and uh, I think it does feel different this time. So we are setting ourselves up to work in you know full stack agile uh, way, you know, three in a box, pizza team, whatever, whatever metaphor you want to use for the you know design, product management, and engineering trio. Um, that's how we're we're set up uh, on the consumer side. The B two B side is a fast follow there. Um, we're, 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 and it's unevenly distributed. I mean, with 120,000 people and huge teams, um, you know, some teams are further along than, than others. So that's how we, we try and line up and do the work and manage the portfolio. Um, and in order to support that, we, we've come up with what we call a design operating model. This was actually something that, um, that uh, I brought with me uh, and it's changed a little bit from Capital One and even from USAA. And the genesis of this was, when I had the uh, fortune to uh, meet and chat with Phil Gilbert, who uh, was, because he's uh, transitioning now and, and retiring, but he was the head of design at IBM and was the, um, the, the impetus behind IBM's kind of pivot towards more of a design centric organization. You know, 10 years ago, they said, uh, yeah, we're gonna hire like 2000 designers. And actually I was just at a conference yesterday and the day before um, with uh, some IBM leadership and uh, they've now got uh, probably you know three or more thousand designers at the organiz in, within the organization. So they've done a, a great job of this transformation. And he had a, a framework at the time um, uh, called uh, PPP equals O, right? So that's, I think it was people, uh, practice and places equals outcomes. Uh, so that that kind of, I'm a framework type of person. So that kind of stuck with me a little bit and I kind of like tinkered with it and added to it over time. And what I'll show you now is what we're currently using at Verizon um, for our kind of design operating model um, framework. So uh, bear with me while I, uh, while I see if I can share my- Cliffhanger, you certainly built momentum right there. Well done. Okay. All right. Let me see if I can get this in full screen. All right. So hopefully you're seeing this this screen. Um, it's, a work, it's a working slide. It's not a pretty one. It's one I found within the last five minutes on this particular computer. So forgive the lack of design here. Um, essentially, uh, you know, on the left here we have our drivers of of the different uh, areas of the design team. Um, and then on the right, we have our, our outcomes. So it's still kind of got this equation like sense to it, right? Um, and uh, forgive me for not finding words that begin with P for communications and finance on the, on the left side there as well. I tried really hard, I promise. Um, Verizon's outcomes, we have four stakeholder groups that our CEO talks about all the time uh, that every part of Verizon anchors towards, which is our customers, our shareholders, our employees, and society in general. These are our four um, uh, four groups that we that we serve that we provide value for. Um, so all of this feeds into that. On the left side, you know, we have here 
the, 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 the purpose, right? So like, why does the design team exist? What's our reason for being um, very much in a kind of Simon Sinek, uh, start with why uh, kind of frame, if you're familiar with that, uh, that, that talk and that, that book he, he wrote. Um, and then we have these four major areas of, you know, our people, because our people, our designers on our team are our biggest asset. Uh, Verizon also believes that our associates across the board are our biggest asset. So this is our kind of like lens on that, right? How do we support this, you know, diverse, um, motivated, skilled and, and growing team? How do we help them grow, right, in their in their craft and their practice? Um, Practice then becomes our second piece. Like, how do those people do their work, right? How do we how do we support them with uh, with uh, templates and and tools um, and, and processes for for doing their work? And how do we get better at that? How do we share across the team uh, what's working in one area and what's what's not working in another? Portfolio then becomes okay. This is the work that we do. How do we make sure we're working on the right stuff, right? Um, so alignment with our business partners um, um, in terms of prioritization uh, and having the right resources on the right um, uh, the right work, uh, and then partners themselves. Like, what are our relationships with our business partners? How do we help? You know, how do we foster the, those? You know, uh, to reach our full potential. Um, feedback mechanisms from our partners, making sure that we're doing what they what they need us to to do because they are you know, some to some degree our internal clients, right? Um, and then across the bottom here, communications, because it's not enough to just do the work. We have to talk about the work as well, um, because that's what within a large organization helps us to get more um, interaction earlier in the process at a more senior level so we can be more influential. So how do we convey our value and share what we're doing? And then, you know, none of this is free. Uh, we have to... Uh, you know, professionally and effectively manage ourselves. So the finance across the bottom, right? How do we keep track of, you know, how to run ourselves as a as a as a well run, well oiled team across the bottom? And if we do all those things correctly, our kind of thesis is, you know, if we have a shared purpose, if we have great, you know, diverse, growing uh, people doing things in a really well oiled practice way, you know on the right set of projects from a portfolio perspective with solid partners and we communicate all of that and we fund it effectively, that we will get the outcomes that we want from a customer shareholder employee and society perspective. So this is what we call our design operating model or DOM for, for short. And this is what we have used for the past couple of years to, um, to try and improve things within uh, the design team. So I won't show the slides, but there's another slide here where we start to uh, kind of uh, score ourselves within each of these boxes. Hey, how well are we doing at people and developing our people and having a diverse team and growing our people? How well is it red, green or yellow? How starting to use this as a dashboard, right, uh, with some specific measures behind it um, to gauge where we need to focus some of our own um, internal improvement initiatives, right? Because it's, it's very easy for all of us, and I've seen this for 20 years on in different organizations, to get very focused on the work, right? Designing the apps and the websites and the, you know, stores and the voice systems and the hardware and whatever. Designing all that stuff and getting putting 100% of our focus on, on that work. But if we do that and we don't take at least, you know, two or 3% or 5% of our internal energy and focus it on ourselves and our team and how we're getting better and how we're making our lives uh you know um, um you know easier or, or or more effective uh from a from an employee perspective then we 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 atrophy it's a little bit the you know the um the the cobbler's shoe children's shoes metaphor right um if we never focus on ourselves we, we we won't grow ourselves so this is an attempt to say hey how can we take a little little piece of a percentage of our capacity right um how can we show this to the team and say hey raise your hand if you are interested in helping you know helping improve the our career path process within the people category for example or the way that we interact with our partners or um the way that we do crit sessions or the templates we use for briefs or uh you know specific deliverable within practices if you're interested in that we'll get a few like-minded people together and we'll carve out some time for you to improve that right uh, and then that can be leveraged across the entire team and we, and we get better at that and hopefully the that particular category goes from you know yellow to green or red to yellow or or, or you know it, it improves and so this is a framework we we have a uh, 
um, a full-time person dedicated to kind of maintaining this framework um, and encouraging teams to kind of form Um, and um, yeah, this is what we've been using for the past couple of years from a um, kind of an internal design operations perspective. All right, very good. Thank you, Richard. Um, I can't see any of you, uh, so <laughs> if there's any questions, I can stop sharing this or I can, <laughs> if you've yeah, got to leave it on for a little bit and then yeah. um, as long as you can hear the voices. Let, let me just check if, you know, it was intended as a Q&A call. And we're already like almost 20 minutes in. Does anybody have any questions? You can use that wonderful feature, uh, raise hand, or I can just pick on a few individuals too. Um, Julian, did you want to say something? Um, yeah, so uh, thanks. This is outstanding. Um, and just for quick background, I'm Julian Mills. I'm with uh, an organization called CPP Investments up in Canada. Um, and so I guess what I'm curious about, like from a management perspective, this is completely intuitive. Um, when you show it to your team, <laughs> are they like, wow, this totally gives me focus and motivation because I buy into your framework or <laughs> or, you know, how do you use it with the team to help them understand um, what you want them focused on, et cetera? I, and I'm being deliberately kind of cold and yeah. McKinsey McKinsey like in my language here, but it's, you know, I think a lot of it is, especially when you're working with creative folks, they you know, they like to be creative. They don't like to be trapped in a framework. Yeah, yeah. Um, so uh, what we generally do when we first introduce this, we kind of talk to the team about the process of how we came to this, um, which was um, uh, actually may have the picture in this deck, I forget, but it, it was essentially like a hundred stickies on a massive whiteboard. <laughs> because what we did was a very generative exercise with um, a bunch of people in the team to say, hey, what's what's challenging about the work that we're doing and how we're doing it um and uh, you know it was a free form you know uh ideation exercise with with stickies very very design like people were very comfortable with it um and we just kind of put them all up on the board right and then we started to say okay well what what groups are they what, what groups are they starting to coalesce into right um, and it started to come into this type of framework. And then I kind of applied a little bit of the prior framework that I brought from Capital One, which wasn't exactly the same as this, but it, it was, it was, we were, at, we were aiming at the same outcome from two different, from a top down and a bottom up perspective. Um, and so we got to this, um, this framework um, and then we kind of validated it and we, we, you know, so we, we tell the story internally with the teams about, you know, we don't just kind of, you know, launch this, this at them. We tell that story of how it was uh, generated. Um, we also acknowledge that it is pretty overwhelming. It can be, I mean, this is a busy slide, but it's not the most busy slide <laughs> of all of these because there's a lot of stuff that goes into a, you know, 600 person team that's providing design services across a, you know, 120,000 person organization. So there is a lot of stuff. Um, my my philosophy for it though is that uh, we don't need to work on all these at once. We don't need to, you know, even if even if three of these are red, we, we probably can't work on all, all three red ones. We, let's just focus on one of them. But understanding what we're not working on can be just as powerful sometimes as understanding what we are working on. So it's a long term a, a long term framework. We don't put it in front of people all the time. Sometimes we just talk, we zoom into a piece and say, hey, how can we get better at, you know, practices? Let's talk about the different ways that we um, that we do our, our work or how can we get better at partners? So, yeah, it, it's a, it's more a, a management framework and dashboard that we use. It, we are transparent with it, though. We don't kind of hide it, including the measures within the team. We're very open about, you know, how we're doing and which areas we need to improve on. Um, and I would say that, you know, over the past two years, uh, certainly as we continue to be consistent with it in front of people. Um, people keep people bought into it. Right, it's helpful. Thanks. Yeah. Very good. That's a good question, Julian. Thank you. And then let's uh, hand it over to uh, Peter in Luxembourg. Uh, yeah. Just um, I mean, this looks absolutely stunning, and of course, it's always difficult to translate this into a taxpayer-funded government organization where we don't talk about revenues. But um, I'm, I'm very curious to know how you, how do you translate this to management resisting to change, uh, which is always one of the biggest issues that we face um, in knowledge management and collaboration. Um, 
So you have this kind of behavior. I mean, you cannot in, you cannot enforce and push people to completely change, but without the management walking the talk, uh, change will never come. Yeah, no, I mean, very true. Uh, I think what we try and do is is try and find shared outcomes for everything, uh, shared things that that management uh, or our partners agree upon um, to find that common ground. Um, and then kind of work backwards from that and say, okay, well, if we all agree that, you know, we want to, you know, work, uh, you know, take this particular dysfunction out of the way we work, whether it's in a portfolio area of a prioritization or whether it's in reviews or, you know, whether it's in the way that we grow and promote people and uh, or whatever, wh whichever area it is, if we all agree that, we, you know, we, we want to remove that barrier or, or dysfunction, or if we want to go to the next level, if something's okay, but we want to be world-class at it, then what are the root causes to that? Um, and then those root causes tend to show up somewhere within this framework, right? Um, so we do that kind of like, um, uh, what's it called? The Ishikawa diagram, the fishbone diagram, where you've got the kind of, uh, you know, the outcome at the end and all the different factors that lead into it. Uh, it's like a, you know, um, process engineering uh, tool. We, we do that and then we find those areas and say, well, okay, if this is causal um, to, to that thing that we wanna change, then that that we all agree we want to change then then something has to change here right and we recognize that that thing that needs to change may well be a change to somebody's job or a, a change to somebody's function or role or responsibility or the way that they've done something for 20 years um but if if we want to get to that new outcome we we, we all agree we have to do something here right so i think it's just paying careful attention to that and and recognizing that um yeah for, for what we might introduce as a small change or what might from our lens be a, a, a trivial process change or whatever, may well have a huge impact on somebody else in the business um, that is the way that they've been doing their work or even the value in their role for 15 years or 10 years. And that that is massively um, you know, impactful to them and, and, and something that they care about. And so I think having some empathy for, for that, which, you know, should be uh, easy, right? Because as design professionals, we're, that, that's one of our, uh, our, our superpowers, hopefully, right, is understanding things from other people's perspective. So I think applying that lens and using that superpower on on this internal stuff, as well as the you know products and services that we design and make, is is super important. And not taking any of that for granted. Not not thinking, oh well, because we want to change this, they want to change it too. That's obviously not the case. We just have to care for that. All right, thank you, Richard. Uh, I, I know I kind of pushed you down this direction with design operating models. Uh, if we zoom out, uh, I think you said zoom in uh, earlier, if we zoom out from this, uh, you said you were recently at a conference. Um, and if we, you know, what is in your view, Richard, you know, design leadership here in 2022, uh, beyond the uh, design ops that we've been looking at for the last 10 minutes? Yeah, absolutely. Let me stop sharing this so I can see you all again. Um, <laughs> it was the uh, so yeah it was the fortune uh, conference actually in brooklyn uh, brainstorm design um and uh, it was my first conference in person in like two and a half years uh, i used to go as you know yanis used to go to quite a lot of conferences and and so this was nice to get back in the room with people um and it was fascinating because it was very much around uh, you know how do we change businesses how do we change large businesses in particular enterprises um, and government because there were some government representatives there to be more um design i don't actually like the term design centric or design led um because uh, i think it puts design on a pedestal and and actually triggers many other people to be like well okay but if it's design led then it's not business led or risk led or marketing led or whatever right uh i, I prefer us to have you know um a a, an organization that where it's got an equal voice, um, right? I, I don't mind customer led, right? That's much better because everybody, or experience led, because everybody can have an impact on that. Design led just seems a little bit self aggrandizing, but um, it was very much about that topic. Um, one of the speakers, um, Bracken, who I, I, I can't recall his last name, but he's the CEO of Logitech and has been for 10 years and has really. Um, uh, kind of architected Logitech's turnaround from a you know m mouse and keyboard producing hardware company to much more of a uh, customer centric you know ex almost experiential uh, company. Um, I, I thought he was an excellent speaker, uh, and uh, you know he he said look he was asked you know what's the biggest thing um, that 
it, you believe is integral to an organization's ability to move in this direction. And he was like, top down support from the CEO comes from the top. Um, and, you know, I, I really do believe that. But I think that we have to find ways to provide our CEOs with that um, that perspective, right? Because not everyone's a, a Bracken who comes into a company going, yes, I'm going to turn this into a design-led company. People get there themselves, right? Our leaders get there themselves. So I think we have to show um, evidence um, of how design can help their business on the things that they care about. Um, um, and I think that we have to show everybody, uh, you know, from the from the CEO all the way down to, uh, you know, uh, everybody in the organization that we have 120,000 people at Verizon. And my mission and goal is to have all of them um, understanding how they contribute towards the customer experience, right? Regardless of whether they're in the legal department, the process engineering, you know, HR, procurement, facilities, everybody, everybody at some is a domino in that chain. Right, no matter how many dominoes back they are from the actual inter interface point with the customer themselves, you know, and you take one of those dominoes out, and and it's not going to work, right? So, like, we we need to help everybody understand that. That's a good point. Excellent. Well, coming up at the end, uh, if anybody has a final closing comments, um, reflections, uh, I hope this was helpful. I I very much enjoyed it, Richard. Um, Let's see if there's anybody here who uh, wants to share feedback or a comment. That's the whole intention with these Q&As. All right, I think, I think we're good. Uh, thank you, Richard, for finding the time to join us on a Wednesday morning, your time, uh, Wednesday afternoon, our time coming in Europe into an extended weekend. But I think, like you said, it's Memorial Day on Monday uh, over there. so. That's also a weekend ahead. Good to see you again. Likewise, this has been fun. Thanks for having me. If anybody does have any follow-up questions or anything, feel free to reach out. I'll send an email uh, with the summary and, and put your email address there, Richard, so that people can continue the conversation. And of course, you're on various social media channels too. Great. Thanks. Thank everybody. you. All right. All the best. Take care.